what was Von Mason like and what did he actually do within that organization or that group? Um, Cause I know you connected with him again later in the eighties for that other success you had. Vaughn, Vaughn was, he was smart in another sort of way. Yeah, what Vaughn did, John was the studio manager for the studio in downtown Washington, a rest studio, you know, proper 24 track studio back you know, back in those times. The Reddings used to record down there. If you remember the Reddings, it was out in Stacy Lavish saw because that, that was a DC producer cool down there. So he had some downtime and Vaughn got the downtime from him, right? And came in with um 24 track tape. You know, he bought the tape and everything. He got um two people to come in and play. Play the groove he wanted to play, whatever. John Freeman played the polymook on that track. The bass on Bounce Rock Skate Row. That actual boom, 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 and programmed that song, that sound, everything. That's one of the most unique, powerful basses that I've ever heard. Okay. So that's him playing that with that bounce to it. Another guy named Hollywood Henderson, I think, is playing percussion. And somebody else is playing guitar. So Vaughn got all these people in there to play, whatever. And then he took 24 track tape and, and went shot the deal. So he went around to probably 10 companies that said no. Until he got to Brunswick. They said, yeah. And then he went to number three on the chart. Well, we got a gold record for it. So would you call him, I mean, was he a producer or a, yeah. he, Well, yeah, he would be the producer in the fact that he produced the 24-track tape, which was his, right? So, yeah, he did do the producer. I mean, they, they did what he wanted, you know, he would do what he wanted to do, so he was the producer, yeah. But the he crew, was. the crew was really the creators of the music, though. Well, the crew was the magic or whatever to it or whatever but i mean you know he had to have at least he had to have the concept of, of something or whatever but of course it takes all the ingredients so in new york new york and that roller skate and whatever and bond was a person that was like if something jumps off with that right there with a he would just do something like that to be b and you don't really think about it or whatever because he's just, just he's just doing this whatever that was one of those times when he did that because that was the same baseline as it was for chic good time which is the same baseline which it was for the rapper's delight so all he really did is just did something like this instead of oh, we're gonna call it <clears throat> bounce rock skate row to do with the roller skating thing and it just jumped off so i had to say that he had he was at least Concept man and a producer. Yeah. He didn't play. He didn't play enough on that record. Mm -hmm. But he was the concept man, producer, and yeah. So yeah, he was. So tell me about and then it branched tell, tell me about when you got back with him and, and you had that uh house music hit. Well that came from going to New York with him, because he, he he New Jersey actually. Yeah, he moved to New Jersey. And that's the same thing as New York as far as the house music and you know tri-state area, club music, whatever. I didn't like it really. I would listen to certain, I would listen to the, the mix show they have come on and I generally would find, I might find a couple of records that I might like or whatever, right? Because that I liked, consequently, I would hear them six months later or a year later in DC. That's how bad how the music would travel, how slow it was at these times. New York might take a year to get down to DC. A year to get down to Atlanta from DC. But Shannon, let the music play, right? That was one record I was in. And I didn't hear it again until like about seven, eight months later, you start hearing it playing in DC, right? Um, Evelyn King record. Those records ended up being national records. But I was hearing lots of club stuff, whatever. And I would do you know, what they want me to do, whatever. I mean, it was it was all right. I mean, I'm not saying I, it, it was new. 
put it that way. And I wouldn't even go out of my way to get into a, not being in DC, I wouldn't. But because I had a different environment now, I'm in New Jersey, that's what we're doing. That's what I got into. Well, you know, she was paying me to do it. And I stayed up in New Jersey and being in New York and go do stuff. So I was much more excited than being in DC. So I did that. And um, he got with a couple other people, you know, doing whatever. And that's how Jack the Groove came about. And that ended up being a top 20 record on the UK pop chart. The second house record ever to jump on the chart after Steve Silk Hurley's Jack Your Body. So about two years later, the next record was ready to come. I was actually in London, 1986. And I had a friend of mine who had uh, worked in a music shop called Rod Argent's Music Shop. So they had all the latest technology to synthesize and all that stuff, whatever. So I used to go in there with him or go in there and see him, you know stuff but because he was having a manager he had me come there after the store was closed because he was a key holder so basically i used to go in there after the shop was closed and then i could sort of mess around with stuff just like you know whatever it was this was that that was this Ooh, i can check that out so sampling was just starting at that second mirage keyboard uh, Profit 2000, emulators, other things like that on the extreme high end Fairlight. If you had like $30,000 to buy one of those up then, the, the other range was like a Mirage and Sonic, which was like 1500 which was like pounds as well. You know, Profit 2000 cost you a couple, or an Akai, Akai 600 or S900 back then. That was a sampling. I couldn't afford none of those things, but I could afford a box of 20 floppy disks. And I will go and get sounds off of all of these things from Fairlight to whatever, whatever, and I'll have the sounds. Mirage is becoming kind of popular. So chances is I could get around a Mirage and I'll have my sound. And I'll have sounds that no one else doesn't have because basically when the sampling came out, that's what it was all about, the sounds you had. They give you a sample library, but that was a sample of just a drums, you know, just a sample library. But the whole thing about it was sampling what it is you really wanted to. Someone had a rack mount of the garage in the studio. So when I went back to New Jersey, I played the sounds. I had about a hundred samples that I made in the shop. I played this, you know. Just playing them. And the sexual sounds are the ones that interested him the most. Out of all the sounds that I had, of all the various type of stuff, the sexual sounds that I got. Some of them I made, some of them come off of blue movies, you know, some of them there, there, some of them I don't know. Those are the sounds that he was interested in. So I'm gonna play those across a beat, whatever, you know, you know, going across a beat, something. Whatever. And um, I think I had been in the studio for who knows when. I probably went back to DC. Probably went, went, even went to London, back to London here, before I even ever heard that real, real good again. And I started, and I didn't even know that I had heard it until about five or six times after hearing it over here on the pirate stations. Pirate stations just like, say, you just start your own station find a frequency and start. So they had plenty of those. And they were for the dance music. I heard this like three or four, five times in an hour and different stuff. I said, is that that track that I did with Vaughn? Is that that? And then it ended up being, it was that. You know, it raised Break for Love. And it became like a real big, um, anthem type of song over here for the UK because they were just starting into this, uh, the acid house generation with the house music, you know, club music, which was really coming from like Chicago, you know, and it started to hit there, hit here. So um, it became one of those demigodic type of songs. And uh, I was like, 
Well, when you're in Rome, you do what the Romans do. So I was like, oh, I'm a house head now. I'm gonna be a house head. I got a record. I'm, in, I'm involved in this like top of the pops, plays on radio one is a top 20 record. And it stayed like that off and on for the next five years. What well, Eric, what were the circumstances that had you go to London in the first the first place? The very first thing is me to go to London was to be Gil's road manager and his personal assistant. That was the first reason that I ever was brought to London. Okay. And you liked it, so you went back? Yep. I liked it. And I, I went back. And also because it was getting kind of wild at home in DC as well. You know, it's kind of wild in DC. You know what I mean? Cracks still start jumping off and everything like that. I don't mean wild as in, you know, people getting killed or whatever. I mean, you know, like friends and people out there, and, you know, everybody's, you know, just doing whatever. And I was like, well, you know, if I stay here, you know, I mean, it's you know, it's gonna be more temptation or whatever, you know. You might be a dabbler or whatever, but basically if you really stay here and you'd be, you know, everybody everyone you know is like that. So you eventually just fall into what everybody was doing. So I was even gonna go to London, go back to London, right? But I was gonna go to Dayton, Ohio. I had a girlfriend who wanted me to come and move her in Dayton, Ohio. She was talking about, yeah, come up here, you know what I mean? Roger Trotman and the Zap Band and this and that's up here. And I thought if I'm gonna make a move, why don't I make a clean move? I'm gonna go 600 miles up to Ohio. Well, my family comes from Ohio. I've been to Ohio enough. Take Columbus is where I used to live. So I'm gonna just go to London, a whole new thing. And I just went. I didn't know what I was gonna do real good, anything. Well, I was gonna stay really, real good. A little bit I did, but that was it. But I did know that in six months, Gil would be coming over for the tour in May and June. So I went and I stuck it out for that time until he came. Then I went on that tour. So and you've been there ever since, all right? Mainly. I went, I've, I've been back in the United States. I lived in the United States from, um, from say, 2000 to uh, 2009, 10. Oh. And I decided that it's like, I live here, I've been here. Now I've come back home. I'm like, you know what? I'd actually rather be yeah. Back there, came back here for ten years. I mean, it was all right. I'm not saying it wasn't. I had a great time, you know. But when it really came down to what I was used to, and like, uh, I don't know, in some degrees, the quality of life and everything, how things were about, it was better for me here. So I, I left. So, back. so you've done some uh, DJing there too, and what other kinds of things have you been involved in uh, musically? The house music. You know, house music is DJs as well. And it's a funny thing. When, I, when those records jumped off, when Break for Love jumped off, okay, I started doing production and working with more other people, adventures of Stevie V, or something on Martha Wash's album, Imagination, you know, um, and years later, whatever, well, Byron Stingley, you know, working with people. And um, the DJs were more important than the producers. And I used to sort of laugh, sort of like the DJs, not laugh at them like personally, but like, you know, y'all play records, and I'm making records, whatever, and whatever. But in the way the business would go, and the way the dance floor in the club would go, the DJ knew what was going to make the people dance in the club, right? So therefore, he became more important than the producer. Because now this guy, DJ, he has his ear on the fucking pulse of what's happening or whatever, right? And became the producer. DJs became bang. I mean, you know, Todd Terry, if you know him, or Marshall Jefferson, or a lot of these DJs, they go out getting like 20, 30, 40 grand a night. A night to play music. That's a little bit more, That's a little bit more than that. A little bit more than I would do events uh, around Los Angeles. <laughs> but then most of that money, though, I, my, I wouldn't say it was going to plan. It was on mixing those records, remixing the Janet Jackson, remixing the Tory Amos, remixing, and they were getting minimum 
five grand mixes, up to like 20, 30 grand a mix. So Passat, so Passat playing for nice figures, they were remixing for those same figures as well. So they became the ones mixing into whatever, you know, whatever remixes, DJs you want to call out, that put them on another level. And today, DJs are the they're the day pop stars. They're the new pop stars. I heard George say, he said, DJs are the new superstars. They're the new rock stars. This is exact words he said. So there it is. And you're you're doing DJing yourself over there today or what? Yeah. I after I left, I probably ciphered over. I when I left DC in 2010, I went to Barcelona. That's where I went to because I was ready to start um, doing more DJing and stuff and whatever, right? But I didn't really take it really serious, you know what I mean? I had to start doing that, and I didn't really take it really serious. But then I said, okay, you know what? Yeah, I will. Because the technology changed and the format, and uh, Pioneer, you know, I got it. they gave me a um, Pioneer control or whatever like that. So I um, like that. I always like the technology, whatever. You know, like the same way that I break for love was done with a lot of samples. That was a new technology, right? DJing had took a new turn on technology now, where you didn't have to have the turntables and this and that and that. Now you could actually have the record and you could have a controller which could mimic some sort of movement like that, but still is a more experimental type of thing. So I said, I'm ready to go to Barcelona now and um you know, jump in there. Because Barcelona is the most beautiful DJ capital, one of them of the world. Because every world class DJ plays Barcelona regularly, either going to or from Ibiza. Okay, because they all goes on at Ibiza in the summertime with all these DJs and stuff like that in Barcelona. So I said, well, I need to just go there then. It's basically, so I need to go. So I was in there a couple of years, whatever, got into the Barcelona scene. And you know, met quite a few people and start playing whatever. La Terraza. La Terraza is one of the biggest clubs in, in uh Spain, whatever, outdoor sort of venue. So I got to play there. I got to play other little places through my little Barcelona core. Uh DJ Ellie Ellie, and another guy named Under Sugar, and they were like the Barcelona underground scene. And I got to get in with that and got this show them the new sort of style of DJ they sort of do, you know, but it's not like so much it used to be where you mix a record in and you hear the other one gradually coming out until they sort of merge. It's the new new ages of DJs, they just like, bang, new break coming on you. You know what I mean? After three or four minutes or five minutes, and it's like, bang, next one come in and it's more intense. Cause you know, when you mix it like that, it's kind of like you have a wave coming up and a wave going down. It eliminated that with certain styles where it's just like it then. So it just stays on a level. So I got to learn more about how, how that goes. You kind of do things how I wanted to mix into. Because I found out that it was like, it was almost, almost like playing an instrument, DJing, depending on what level approaching it, you know? Like Kerry Candler. Kerry Candler would have a keyboard and he'd be playing on little riffs sometimes while he's DJing and he's on sort of riffs. So really it got to be close to a musician. Back when um when Herbie Hancock did Rocket. DST. DST. He was the first DJ that was taken into a, a artist's band as a, another musician or whatever to the thing. So it was already coming that way. Wheels, 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 wheels. wheels. I'm getting feedback, but uh, are you using the uh, turntable still or are you using CDs or what? No, I use a Pioneer controller. I actually use a controller or whatever. That's what I use. And um, there's other people using the controllers. I don't know if you've ever heard of a guy called Gerald. He's one of the famous notables. Steve Dick Hurley, you might have heard of, but he's from Chicago, whatever. He uses those. I mean, right now, in the age of how it is now, to deliver 
a good set is what it should be all about. If a guy could get an eight track play and hook it up to a reel to reel and have some 45s playing and be throwing down the set, what difference does it make? If he's moving the people on the floor and they're feeling and he's taking them where they want to go, you know what I mean? It shouldn't be a thing of um, what medium are you using? You could go back to how it was when you had an acoustic guitar and the electric guitars came out, right? Well, people that played acoustic, they wasn't so famous, they didn't so friendly want that electric guitar, did they? They didn't really like that, whatever. Guitar came in to be a guitar. Same thing with CDs and vinyl. It was vinyl for all those years. And I remember when CD decks first came out, it's a good 20 some odd years ago, whatever. The DJs and people was like, oh no, mm, no, no, it's digital. Oh no, this, that, no. Okay, there was resistance for a while. Now, it's like that's a standard thing that you'd see anyway as a CD. So now the media has changed again. Controllers and they even got some other type of technology. And a lot of DJs play on sticks nowadays, okay? Like, well, you know, USB sticks? A lot of DJs don't even have CDs anymore. They have the file and everything. Put them into the deck, and you just run you run your set, so. You, you know what I love about that is how easy it is to bring your music with you. You know, I used to carry these super heavy crates of records everywhere. It broke my back. See, that's what I'm saying. So then, you know, DJs walking around with a couple keys on their neck. <laughs> Right, that's it. They've got like three, four thousand songs. Yeah, well, you have some that still have the CDs as well. You know, what I mean, you have some that play that vinyl as well. You know, but it's going to another level now. So, what role does uh, we're gonna have to wrap this up pretty soon, uh, Eric? But what what role does does funk play in your life these days? Well, I'm I'm doing funk again. You know, I mean, I never never stopped liking funk. It's just I came to a country and an environment. And I was known, noteworthy, and notable for the house music through Break for Love, through Jack the Groove. We worked with other people here in that dance sort of thing, Imagination, Martha Wash. But I never stopped being into folk music. Like I said, when George and Bootsy would come over, I'd make sure I'd go and see them. And the last four years, the last four years strong, I've been back next to George, whatever, but he comes over and just taking in the vibe, you know what I mean? It's, um, so it's somewhat of a different than I'm used to. It's still P funk, but it's just another level, another dimension, you know what I mean? Well, they're into third generations now. So uh, that's why I call it the third generation band, where I'm really I'm really accustomed to the um, to the first generation band, which is you know, those those are people and the second generation somewhat, you know what I mean? But that's that's what I'm really used to. That's where I had my foundation from. So that even goes to James Brown. So I still love that. So I've been um working on some things. And I'm gonna get to George, whatever, and see what he thinks, whatever, and see how he breaks my funk or whatever, because you know George is doing well. Give me three on that one. Give me a four on that one. I want to see what number I can get, you know what I mean? So, you know, George give me a number. Hey, that's give you a number. It's a good number. He's giving it to you. If I got a four or five from George, I'd be like, wow, I still got some funk in me now. You, so you were uh, there, I think um, you told me you were uh, there a few years ago when you did the residency at the Metropolis, right? Or Yeah, yeah. That was the yeah. first time that I got back to getting the P4 click with her after being out of it for about 10 years, eight, nine years. That must have been phenomenal to uh, be at. Were you at all the days or what? The entire thing. That's what I'm saying. I was at the whole thing, wow. which was the night was a concert, you know, in the studio. It was a really exclusive event. Believe me, it was like 1,500 pounds uh, per ticket for the weekend. That means Friday and Saturday all day, whatever, night and Sunday. Friday was just a concert. Saturday was a recording session where they were cutting new tracks in the studio and whatever. And I think Josh Stone uh, partook in some of that. And they were cutting it to vinyl as well. They got in, in Metropolis, they got a vinyl cut in the room. So they was cutting it to vinyl. They're doing all these these things, recording these tracks, and you know, 
doing that. Then the third day, it was like a, a meet and greet or more like a George panel where he would just, you know, answer people's questions and this and that and speak to these people in that context on the third day. So that's what it was, I think February, you know, 2014, that entire weekend. So I, you know, I saw everything from, um, from start to finish. That was the first time I'd been back, you know, and I called my sister. I said, Candy, uh, I'm going to see George. George is coming over here, but I don't know nobody no more. I ain't been around no more. What am I going to do? So just ask for call on. To call on. And you tell her you're my brother. And Bob Bishop is your brother in law. And she'll look after you. So, all right. So I went and I found Carl on. And I said that to her. And she said, okay, really? All right. What do you need then? And then she just was all right, you know? And we became more friends over the last, you know, few years. And then that helped me to see George again. And then the other people that I hadn't seen were still there. And the relationship just went from there. And I think it wasn't even that year. It was later that year that when I talked to George more in depth, whatever, where I would just be like, like me and you are, just me and George, man, talking. He didn't realize that I had just been, you know, not far from him. I was sitting on the bus, um, just two seats from George. We were going to see Michael Jackson victory tour. It was at RFK Stadium, it was sold out. That was the weekend that it was a BMI tribute to James Brown at the Washington Convention Center. Tupac was on that. So I went down there. That was one of the occasions where the boogie um, pulled me behind the thing because there was like a curtain barrier to some part of the backstage. I didn't say how that worked with it. It was kind of a curtain thing, right? And I was walking out here just, you know, out just kind of like not lost, but you know, out in what I call general public, whatever. And I thought I heard his voice or whatever, you know. And I stuck my head to do the, the thing because you could. And I said, Hey, Boogie, what you doing? Hey, get me back. He said, Get your little ass back here, whatever. So, um, they played for the James Brown thing, and then the hotel was like a high, high, it was kind of connected. If it wasn't connected to the venue, it was really, really close to the venue. So, I went and got on the elevator, whatever. I see my sister kind of bug her about going to see Michael Jackson because it was sold out, it was then sold out. And I just jumped on the elevator. It was one of these sort of, um, sort of like translucent elevators they had back in the day to kind of you see them on the outside of the building. Yeah, glass uh, elevator. It was one of those little things like that. And I got on the elevator like real quick trying to go to it and the door closed and everything. And I looked up and it was James Brown and his wife. And them elevators ain't really big either. They just kind of like, so I was just like, it's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Brown. And, um, you know, he took his hand, whatever. And, um, I was just here for a while. And he says, that's all right, son. You know, all right. And it wasn't too much longer until it got to the floor. And I ran out that joint. I flew out that joint and told my sister, whatever, you know. And I said, I want to go see Michael Jackson. I want to see the Michael Jackson thing, Candy. I want to see it. So he says, well, you know, um, might be able to get you on the bus. Because George is going to have a bus for the band. Because he's taking the band to see Victory Tour. Not going to need no tickets or nothing. He's going to go right up there to that door there. I already know he's coming. He's going to go right to that gate. And they're going to open that gate. They're going to let him in. So who was on that bus to get in? So I'll keep you on that bus. And it was just like on that bus. And I didn't even, I didn't know a lot of a lot of people. It was just me get on that bus. And what I ended up sitting down was just two things from George. He on a San Diego Chargers football jersey, the little strings in there. I remember that. And he was just sitting there talking to the band. The bus was full up anyway. And they drove and they went to there. And it was a little delay for them opening them big um gates at RFK, you know. It was about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It was some delay and some chit chat and some this and that and that. But eventually, they opened up, drove through there. And I got to see the Michael Jackson victory tour or whatever. So I said to George then at that time, I said, well, you know, um, we were still on the bus for this Michael Jackson thing. And we were doing that and that and that and that. And he said, 
That was you? I said, yeah, that was me, George. I've always been around in the black ground. He, George, George has a remarkably uh, good memory, um, especially considering yeah. you know all his recreational activities. Yeah, but he remember because I'm saying I'm sure I, I, I was um almost green thumb on that bus because that bus was strictly on them band people and everything like that, right? You know, they got me on it. I don't even know if Bob was even on that bus, so I know he remember because it'd be like, who is that? And I've been that sort of who is that person throughout <laughs> from 1978, nine up to now. See, with truth and rhythm, we've unveiled the mystery man, Eric Dial. Well, I don't know about mystery. I just been in. Like, <laughs> it's cool. I, li I like the fact that, you know, I'm just a regular guy, you know, walk down the street, blah, blah, blah. I mean, in the UK for that record, for that break for love record, though. They pretty phenomenal about that, whatever, because they still play that record today. It plays on Radio One. I still do DJ things and do some PAs on it. So that is what I'm more known for, you know, but I have done other things, funky things, and I'm a funk baby. So now, if we can, I can preview this funk track that I'm going to get to George, whatever, and get his number rating on it, you know? Hey, let's hear it. Fire it up. My man Cristiano, you know, you gotta have bass, okay? When I came up, you know, James Brown, everything in your band and funk, you have to have bass, okay? I mean, you can do synthy things. I'm playing synthy things with them, but you need to have bass. So, yeah, my man, Chris, my man Cristiano, he'll supply the bass, yeah, and we'll play, yeah. we'll play with the track. Don't count the strings, yeah. And we'll Some see. people say it's too many. What's the track called? It's about. The funk. Okay, I'm just gonna fire it up. And we're gonna fire it up everything and then we go out like that. Okay, you switch on the thing. There you go. I don't know. Are we for level two loud? Okay. Level's good. Okay, fuck okay. it, let's do it. Shit. Thank <laughs> you. 
Every day I can get away with a fucking six string bass solo. Yeah, that's well, yeah, time. it's kind of spontaneous, but because you asked, I said, you know what? I want. She said, can you jam something? Oh, yep, yeah. just jam something. So, nice, I appreciate it. it. Good job. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, good fun. Well, he's a he, he's a good judge. So basically, he's a because he, he's well, it's 1989 or 80. So I really saw this stuff. You've been down there, like. That consistent sort of line. See, I sort of fell off for ten years and then came back. But basically, you've been like right straight through. Yeah. Well, you know what? I, I've been glad to see it have a resurgence. You know, so that's what's really cool. I reckon that there's someone in the UK, uh, perhaps from a slightly different generation. I can see it coming back. People listen to it, and people who perhaps have been against musicianship are hearing it and getting back into the groove. You know. Yeah. Funk is. It never left. George plays about, I wouldn't be surprised if it was 200 states a year that he plays all around the world. He's been doing this for the last four years. Yeah. So Funk is back. It's just a matter now who's going to be the person other than Bruno Mars or somebody else to really come across with this Funk. It's going to, it's, yeah, it's there. Were you surprised? Did you ever expect when you uh, were hanging around in DC in the late 70s? That George would still be around doing what he's doing. No, <laughs> you know a lot of people are not doing it, but George now is effectively the closest thing that you're going to find to James Brown. And if you want to go anywhere just closer or less of that, it's just going to be Boots. Those are the two people. So, although geographically speaking, if you take, I'm going to move out of the way. Hey, this is the UK contingent. God bless all of you. And yeah, as you were. Okay, well, is that all cool with you? That that sound came down good and everything. You know, I'm like, thank you. You know what I mean? Because I thought it would, you know be an interesting story or something, the music and do something. And then you made it um like play a place up in the end. See now you might have your people uh now you might having people want to um you know get on your show and play a track or whatever. Yeah, no, that's very cool. So where'd you get the uh, uh, rhythm guitar sample? That's not a rhythm guitar sample. He actually played the guitar. Okay. Cristiano. Oh yeah. No, I Cristiano. Played, yeah. Cristiano played the guitar. Played the guitar. This little the Ibanez guitar. guitar right here. So that's what I'm saying. He played that right, guitar. Actually. So played, that was already there. Played this the right here. That's the one. Play that strat on so that. So he played that, but I I had to sort of give him my interpretation of how I heard guitar. Okay. I, I'm a James Brown person, so I want to hear or whatever. So, you know, some of the inflections, he might have been slightly, I wanted to hear that like James Brown. And James Brown going that, that's that James Brown, princey type of stuff. I want a line like that to make me, you know, to be this kind of funk that I'm talking about. So that was actually him playing it. And he played the bass. And then I, you know, program, I programmed the drums, whatever, like the zap sort of. Uh, clap sound that I'm thinking about with the hi hat still moving in that sort of zap vein and and this general a funk sort of bass and you know there's a couple of little synthy parts inspired by um by Bernie Worrell you know what I mean I mean these these are these are the things people I've been around so this is what the kind of funk I interpret if I was going to be doing something like this this is how my funk would be sounding. I'm not finished. There's still a couple of things I need to really do. It's not like it's a finished product, but basically though, 
you want me to jam something and i guess it's enough together to give you a, yeah yeah keep it up i want to hear a whole record of it Tell you something, just before the three guys cut off this is a little aside i'm going to be off camera off camera dialogue um maybe it was about 1997 i did a couple of gigs with clyde stubblefield here as a young man and you know it was a privilege and i'm like what the f what's 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 this guy doing playing with me i'm a sort of 21 year old bass player and he's like you know what like he showed me some showed me some shit. you know we it was a jam it was a drum clinic we did two days he needed a bass player and i did it two drums him another drum the man who i've found that same groove with in this manner so it's like the same flavor and the same flavor of funk and like all i can say is that that's my only other connection with you know a funk origin well yeah. i got you know for that reason though because i've known christian o for several years and you know he always said we're going to still do something so and i was like well if i come in the studio and do something with you i'm going to do some funk that's what it is that i'm compelled to go and record i'm known for doing house music here i do house music all the time just in that but if i want i want to do some funk and i mean not like brit funk or funky esque i want to come and do funk as i know it and i think i can do it with you because you story so you like the funk and this and that and that so that's how it all came about whatever because funk is not the biggest thing ruling over here or whatever therefore and, and i used to do stuff with boogie me and boogie know stuff in the studio before and if i had boogie here then okay yep i know i could get that or whatever but um there is anybody here as such so i yeah, had that vibe and um i figured it with him and me knowing what i i would accomplish what i needed to probably take some time or whatever in this dude but i could get it I wanted to ask you, have you heard Bootsy's record, latest record? I've heard a couple of the tracks. Yeah, it's I like it a lot. And it's got yeah. you know that strong rhythm guitar in it too. And uh that makes a big difference. I mean, like you're saying, the real funk also has to have not only that bottom and the keys doing their thing, but you gotta have that rhythm guitar. I was gonna yes. ask you, we, we've been talking oh shit, because we've been talking about the fucking mix on on the guitar on, on this track what would you make what do you make of the he, okay he, he likes the guitar he said yeah he said where well, i get the guitar sample from i said that's no sample yeah, I mean, that's, that's what i said playing so, right oh, here. okay cool so that it's staying but that is <laughs> that, that is um yeah about funk, the funk that i know with the zap man or if you go with james brown or if you go with prince or funkadelic or a couple of the other groups if it's funk a guitar is playing cameo. Yeah, the rhythm guitar helps is, set it off. It's a relevant element in any Rick James. Take your pick. Guitar is a relevant thing as well as the bass with some keyboards and the drums and the beat. Uh, That's where it really lies from. I want to ask you also, have you heard of Mono Neon? I've heard of him, but I haven't heard it. Try to check him out on YouTube or something like that because he was playing... He was the last guy that was playing with Prince. Okay. And they did some tracks together where they used like a voice box and it was real funky. Mona Mia. I got a friend of mine who played with Prince. This guy named Michael Scott. Oh, yeah. Guitar. Michael Scott is from D.C., though. He's from D.C., okay? I know him from D.C., from us growing up together, being around. He was actually playing with Yarbrough and people. That's who he was playing with at that time, right? And this was just before I made my move to go to London, right? He said that he was moving to Minneapolis, right? And he and he moved. And I never heard from him or didn't, didn't well, I was in London, so I lost contact with him. And I was at the House of Odium, 1990, I don't know, I don't know if it was four, three, five, but it was the sounds of blackness, whenever that record came out. And it's at the home hands of Odium forming in London, and I was just there standing, standing back looking, and then I was like, how come that guy looks familiar? I don't know the sound of blackness. When it got closer, it looked real good. That was Michael Scott. So after the show, I went and go saw Mike. and said, yeah, what's up, Michael? I ain't seen you for years, boy. When Minneapolis, yep. So basically, he'd been playing inside of, of the circuit or the clique from then, 
Yes. And eventually, the MPG, on, yeah. I, see, I see them playing with Prince Band, at least, at least two or three Prince Bands I seen him playing with, right? So, um, yeah, I, I knew Michael Steph. All right, well, I'm going to uh, wind this down, Eric, unless there's anything else you want to add to get out okay. as a message to the people. How can they keep up with uh, what Eric Dial's up to? You know, it's to my Facebook. That's just going to be Eric Dial, you know, E-R-I-Q-E-D-I-A-L. You still just see uh, little things going on or whatever. I mean, not a whole lot, but at least, yeah, you, you can get a glimmer of what's happening. Or All right, I appreciate you wearing the Shake the Gate uh, shirt and uh, all your great stories. Okay. I'm going to uh, wrap it up for us here, so just stand by, if you would, Eric. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for coming on, and thank you for the music and, and all that. Appreciate it. So it's time to wrap up this edition of Truth and Rhythm. Again, thank you to Eric and to uh, your, your 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 friend. Um, Siano Bass. Siano Bass. All right. Thank you, and thank you for having us. It was like a privilege. Be sure to be on the lookout for other episodes of Truth and Rhythm at funkinstuff.net. And always a sincere thank you to listeners and followers of the show. Look for upcoming episodes. Um, catch up with previous installments on YouTube, iTunes, other leading providers. I want to hear from you. Drop me an email at scottg at funkinstuff.net. That's actually how Eric and I connected for the first time. And so on behalf of Mr. Eric Dial, all the way from London, England, this is Scott, Dr. Jake Skullfine, as always saying, keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one.